and that is a, a great way to talk about our next speaker. Our next speaker, many of you know from Channel 8. Um, he, uh, we, we've all kind of seen his face, and, and we, we know a little bit about him, but I was fortunate to be introduced to him about a year ago, I think, and um, I didn't even remember why somebody was, uh, was hooking us up over lunch, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to meet Jeff Brady. That's kind of cool. And when I first met him, I had this interesting reaction to he's either like, you know, really one of those arrogant kind of news guys or he's like the real deal. I mean, I couldn't quite figure it out. And as I got to know him, what what I found that was absolutely amazing is for a media guy that was on this side of the camera, what he got more than anybody was what we were thinking about on that side of the camera. And so he's translated that into a fabulous business strategy. He has a book that's coming out, and he's going to talk about how do you create a brand echo, how do you get your brand to echo so that social media can pick it up. So let's hear it for Jeff Brady. Thank you, Terry. Is this on? Hello, hello. <laughs> we have a bingo. Let's talk about TV and travel, <laughs> shall we? Okay. Take a trip with me. It's a misty morning in a Central American jungle, 1998. You are a seasoned television news anchor from the ABC affiliate in San Antonio, Texas, and you've traveled quite a way. You've gone more than 1,000 miles to the southern tip of Mexico. Why? Because there's a story there that you want to bring home. A rebel army has seized more than 100 acres there on the border between Mexico and Guatemala. They've taken over. Okay, the army, the state and local militias have no control. It's a no man's land, and yet there you are. <laughs> You've traveled with one friend and fellow journalist, a photojournalist from the same ABC TV station. You've flown into Chiapas, Mexico. You've traveled on the back of some flatbed trucks up the switchback roads, deep into a mountainous region known as the Lancondon jungle. No man's land. And now you've made your way to the entrance to this rebel compound. 100 acres, no one controls it except the rebel army, and they're bordering on some civil war with the Mexican government. Now you're staring down the hot muzzle of an AK-47 owned by one of these angry rebel soldiers. Now I don't know about you, but when you're traveling, looking into the muzzle of an automatic weapon has a way of broadening your experience. <laughs> Let me show you what this looks like. In that moment, this young man has three questions for you. <laughs> three questions that you need to answer in order to get past him. Who are you? Quien eres in Spanish. Where are you going? A donde vas? And who do you have with you? Quien andas con tu? How you answer those three questions will determine a lot. Initially, whether or not you're going to get past him into the rebel compound. Now, after about 20 years in the television news business, you know a thing or two about getting to the point, okay? In and out of situations like this, not all were nearly as dangerous, not all involved uh, that kind of firepower. Although, uh, now that I think about it, there were a couple of city council meetings in Tyler <laughs> that involved almost as much illegal firepower, but, you know, we don't have time for that. So let's just skip over that and tell you that when you're in a situation like that, and you've spent a career in television news, you know how to get to the point, okay? You really do. At least you're better. And my point tonight is not to bore you with stories about a career in television news, uh, but my point tonight is to talk about growth, okay? And, and unpacking some of the experiences in a career in television news so that we can talk about developing a message with real impact, developing a message that matters, some of the ideas that, that Marjorie part, pointed out. It's all about customer service. It's all about resonating with that audience. It's all about developing a message that is real, that's relevant, and that is remembered. Now, these are the three questions that I was asked in Spanish. How I answered those questions on that day determined a lot. Did I get past that checkpoint? Did I get access to the rebel leaders we had come to interview? Did we get home with the story? We'll circle back to that in just a minute. I'll kind of leave you hanging. It's a, it's a tease. It's a TV term. It's a tease. Mm -hmm. 
But what we're going to talk about is really developing that message that matters, developing a message that's real, that's relevant, and that is remembered, or harnessing the power of brand economics. As Terry mentioned, the, the, the holy grail here is developing a message that has a brand echo. Word of mouth marketing 3.0. How do we get there? How do we develop a message that travels by itself, virally? On its own. Now, what this means for you is we're going we're gonna to kind of push the envelope. I'm going to ask you to do some things that are somewhat counterintuitive, and I'll guarantee you the last PR guy or ad agency you talk to is not going to talk about these things. So bear with me for a few minutes because we're going to talk about some things that you may not have heard before. Three messages that I want to use to get you to broaden your mind and think about how you can develop a message that really resonates with people that they will carry on their own. Okay? First of all, we're going to flip the focus. It's not all about you, Terry. It's not all about that brand that you've worked so hard to develop. Secondly, we're going to talk about bringing the fix, solving the problem, being of ultimate or platinum customer service, something Marjorie touched on. And then lastly, we're going to talk about shrinking the audience. Now, when is the last time you heard a TV guy talking about shrinking the audience? We want millions of people watching us. No, maybe the better approach is to really focus the message. So instead of at least being in front of millions of people, we're going to really delight one person. And that's where the brand echo starts. Okay? So we're going to start with some definitions. Definitions are great because it sets the table. So we're all starting from the same reference point. A brand, okay? Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed. Bun. Bun. Melts in your mouth, not in your hands. You're in good hands with... Right, brand messages. We've heard them all. We grew up with them all, okay? And that brand message is really a promise. We've all heard the promise term. It's a promise made in a one-way direction, from that merchant to the customer. It's a promise made. But what is a brand echo? What are we talking about here? This is a whole different dynamic. It's the same kind of promise made, but it's made laterally, from customer to customer. I had a great experience with Zappos. Let me tell you what my experience was like. I got the gold shoes, they weren't used, and don't they look great on me tonight? What a powerful brand message. And note, this is the most powerful kind of message that can ever be conveyed, conveyed about your product or service, and it's one you'll never tell. That's kind of a tough nut to swallow. It's one you'll never tell because it'll be told for you, and it will be believed more quickly and more readily because it doesn't come from you. That's a brand echo. Economics, okay, as long as you didn't sleep through the class in uh, high school or college, it's the social science that analyzes the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. Origin is a couple of Greek words that mean rules of the house. Did you know that? Okay, well, there it is. There you go. Even if you did sleep through the class, class I'm here to help you. But <laughs> brand economics, okay, if we extrapolate on that, it's the analysis of the production, distribution, and consumption of a brand message that travels horizontally between customers. How do we do that? How do we create a viral message for God's sakes? We all want it. We all want that Blendtec viral video. How do we get there? That's what we're going to unpack tonight. That's what we're going to talk about. Okay? And there's one more definition I want to give you because it doesn't really happen unless you reach that one person who's really going to make a difference and that's the brand catalyst. Okay? This is that one person who's a well-connected consumer who has been delighted with your brand and who ignites the brand echo instinctively, automatically, and free of charge. Sound good? Not bad. Not bad at all. Okay. But is that really what it's all about? Okay. As they say in Hokey Pokey, is that what it's all about? Do kids still play Hokey Pokey? I don't know. It's probably a different kind of game these days. But regardless, <laughs> is that what it's really all about? Is it your brand message that really matters at the end of the day? Is it growing that bottom line, that P&L statement? If you don't mind me saying so, if you don't mind me pushing the envelope and preaching a little bit, you have a bigger brand echo, a bigger brand message than just what your P&L statement or your profit margin indicates. Your company has a brand echo. Your family has a brand echo. And you have a brand echo. So what will people be talking about when you leave the room tonight? What will people be talking about when you retire? What will people be talking about at your eulogy? Whoa, didn't know you were going to go there, Brady. Okay, all right, we'll table that for now. But think about it. 
This echo concept has bigger implications than just what you take home at the end of the day. Okay? Why do we need this? Why can't I just buy a couple of ads? Come on, Brady, you're the Channel 8 guy. Can't I just buy a couple of spots on Channel 8? We get them in prime time and we'll be good to go. Right? We're set. We're fine. Everybody will see it. Ain't necessarily so. Okay, we live in an era of clutter, in case you haven't noticed. It's a crowded, chaotic media marketplace. There's too many messages vying for your attention all at the same time. It's this real estate that they want right here. It's this real estate. I'm an Aggie, so there's not a whole lot up here, but this is what they want, okay? They're trying to grab onto that and hold it and brand you with a message that will affect your behavior, okay? It's a cluttered landscape. And we live in an era of abundance. You may not have thought about this before, but we really do. In this economy, it's hard to think about abundant times, but think about this. We live in an era of a, an abundant food supply, okay? Uh, an abundant supply of credit. And I would extrapolate abundant media. You can get it anywhere, on your hip, on your smartphone, okay? Right in front of you uh, in the men's room, in the elevator. There's media. Sounds great, but not necessarily. The misuse of any one of these can lead to problems. An abundant food supply, it's great, but we misuse it, it leads to obesity, right? We misuse credit, abundant credit leads to bankruptcy. We misuse all the media platforms that are around us, and it really leads to apathy. That's the bottom line. There's so much that we don't pay attention to any of it, okay? Uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Herbert Simon said this, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. There's so much out there, we're not paying attention to any of it. We don't care. It'll be there tomorrow. I'll get back to it later. There's too much. Okay. In fact, there's so much out there. This is something that Marjorie alluded to. We've really put up barriers. There are more barriers now than ever before to prevent media from entering our lives. I don't want all that email coming in to me, so I put up spam filters. I don't want all the TV, so I use TiVo, right, to record just the specific media that I really want, then I'll watch it later. I don't care to listen to the radio, so maybe I've got a, a Pandora channel that I listen to all the time, or a, a, a podcast, or perhaps a playlist on my iPod. That's the media that I want, and I'm going to put up barriers to prevent the rest of the stuff from getting at me, because I don't want to waste my time. I have caller ID. Same thing, right? You've got to have caller ID, otherwise the marketers are going to get a hold of you <laughs> every single time. So the term that we come up, have come up with to identify this and to really nail the kind of message that you've got to develop is biomedia. Uh, well, we'll get to that in just a minute. Information fatigue syndrome. That's what I'm talking about here. Okay. Information fatigue. You may laugh, but this is really, look it up on WebMD. It is an actual malady that we're all dealing with. Information fatigue syndrome. We're inundated in it, okay? Have you updated that Facebook page today? Okay, did you watch that piece on the Today Show this morning? It was all about your industry. It was perfect. You really got to go back and watch it if you haven't seen it yet. Did you read that article of the DBJ? Okay, you got to go back, take a look at it. It's perfect, okay? It really identifies what we're dealing with right now. And on and on and on. Information fatigue syndrome, IFS. Don't worry. Um, Pfizer is working on a pill. They've, uh, it's a little green pill. It'll be out in the fall, so we'll all be uh, cured from information fatigue syndrome. But as I was saying before, the way to get beyond this right here is creating something called biomedia. Okay? Biomedia. What is that? By invitation only. You think about it. You think about your own life. The media that really gets through, that really resonates, that makes a difference in your life, you're going to invite that media in. Why do we love TiVo? Love TiVo. It's great. It can skip the commercials, right? Love the caller ID. I'm not going to pick up the phone unless it's somebody that I recognize. Love the barrier, okay? Think, same thing with a spam filter, okay? I, I, just your email inbox. You're not going to even open the email unless it's somebody that you know you recognize the sender, and you're going to pick it up, open it up, and read that email, right? So the question for all of us becomes, how do we develop a message that rises to this standard? How do we develop a message that's invited to the table, that people welcome into their lives? And they say, I want a piece of that. I'm going to hang on to that and keep it with me. How do we craft that? How do we create it? What are the ingredients? Okay. That's what we're going to talk about here tonight. 
Uh, and there I was at the corner of Clutter and Clarity anchoring the news <laughs> on Channel 8, right? You know, the problem is the media channels that used to uh, sift out some of these issues now have become part of the problem. And I loved it. I worked at Channel 8 for eight years, a great environment, a great organization. But as we all know, television news is really trying to re-identify itself, right? Realign itself to remain popular and pertinent in this cluttered landscape that we've been talking about. Okay? That's the issue. That's the problem. That's what we're trying to address. Uh, so in March of 2009, I decided to take a leap of faith and stepped away from the sterile studio and walked out onto the street where real media reads real people, okay, to develop some services for our clients using some of the tools and technologies from a newsroom. And that's what we do. But I remembered even then that when we did it best, when we nailed it at Channel 8, is when we did this. We developed messages. We told stories that were real, that were relevant, and that people remembered. Okay. And it would happen all the time. People would walk up to us on the street and say, Hey, Jeff, man, that story that you guys aired a couple of weeks ago, the one about the, the, the woman who uh, lost a daughter uh, in a tragic accident, they had to make a decision right then and there about organ transplant, and they decided to move forward, and, and then you guys showed how she met up with the woman who was the recipient of her daughter's heart, and they put the stethoscope up on the chest of the woman who had been... And, she heard her daughter's heart beating. Oh, my gosh. I signed up that day to be an organ donor. A real message that was relevant to people who were watching, that was remembered even weeks later. doesn't happen too often. That's when we knocked it out of the park in TV news. So if we can develop the same kind of message that resonates with the right audience, now we've got a brand echo that we're developing. Okay? Now we've got a brand echo that we're developing. So how do we go about that? Okay. How do we go about that? Who knows what this is? Any idea? I better stop you before people start shouting out answers. Okay, it's not what you think. This is not a brand new concept. Developing a powerful message that captures the attention of an audience is not a powerful message, uh, not a brand new message. You go back about 200 years, okay, Native American culture, right? When the tribal councils would gather, and the tribal chief would have to command the attention of all the people gathered, he would use one of these. It's called a talk stick, okay? You hold up the talk stick, you command the attention of the teepee. People have to pay attention. When you're done, you hand the talk stick off to the next person, and then he has the ability to command the attention of the, the gathered tribe. We need a talk stick for the 21st century. We really do. And I'm here to tell you that we, we've got one. It worked at Channel 8, it works for Shakespeare, it works for Socrates, okay, it works for my five-year-old daughter at <laughs> night when she says, Daddy, she's going to bed, what does she say? You guys who are parents know, tell me a story, right? Tell me a story. Don Hewitt was the originator and uh, producer of 60 Minutes way back, and uh, when budding journalist would meet him in New York or talk to him on the scene of a story, say, how do I get to where you are? How do I rise to the occasion? How do I improve my craft? He would say the same thing. Tell me a story. Make it a good one. Tell me a story. Okay. Why is that powerful? Why is that powerful? Why do stories resonate like nothing else? Okay, there's a little bit of brain science here. Okay, John Medina is a molecular biologist who's written a story called Brain Rules. Okay, and he talks about the amygdala, deep inside the brain. We all have one. When you encounter an event or a story or a communication that really registers with you as a powerful component, the amygdala releases a little bit of dopamine. Have you heard of this before? A little bit of dopamine. It's a chemical that helps the brain organize and process information. That's what dopamine does. So it's like a little post-it note. Okay, the amygdala puts up a post-it note and said, remember this. And you do. And you do. So the goal here, the end game, the holy grail is to reach the amygdala with your message. Okay? And get that little bit of dopamine released because your message, your brand message, has, has such a powerful echo to it that people grab onto it and retain it. That's the key. Okay? It's a little tease here. Stories are powerful, very powerful, and they go way back. Okay, they go way back in time. All of the most powerful communicators have used them to deliver messages, powerful messages. Uh, 
Jesus, okay, conveyed very powerful messages, but he didn't talk about theology and philosophy. He told parables, right? So this notion of, this image of the prodigal son coming home and the father killing the fatted calf, it says a lot about theology and about forgiveness without having to go into a big treatise, okay? There was a, uh, a powerful piece of literature that I've just alluded to that was written right after World War II when there was some real challenges with race relations in this country regarding uh, the Japanese and what had happened at Pearl Harbor and what happened to this country in the confinement camps in California. Really tough, really hard. A lot of us don't remember that, don't remember that time. But there was a piece of literature that came out about this time that had a subtext addressing that issue, okay? And there was one line that I would venture to guess that a lot of you will remember that addressed that conflict in the U.S. communities regarding race relations after World War II. Okay. Any, any guesses? The author was Dr. Seuss. No matter where you are, big or small, a person's a person, no matter how small. This is the piece of literature right here. Horton, here's a who. Okay, And because that message registered with a lot of people, we remember it. We hang on to it. We keep it. We own it to some degree. Okay, So what this means for us is the media landscape is crowded. It's very confused. It's chaotic. Okay, You're going to get invited to the table by having a contagious story, and that's where your brand echo begins. That's where the brand echo begins. Okay, Problem here is that most people are telling the wrong story. I don't really care about your new VP of IT. I don't really care about that new store you opened up. Okay? I don't really care. It doesn't resonate with me. It's not important to me. It's not going to reach the amygdala and get that dopamine released. Great companies do it differently. Great companies create an environment where you're going to create a story and tell it on your own. You create the story and you bring it home. Walt Disney. The great stories that are told about Walt Disney involve my trip to... Let me tell you what happened when I went to Disney World and my granddaughter got to meet Cinderella, right? Or Apple. Let me tell you about the podcast I just created or the playlist on my little phone. Yeah? Whole Foods. Let me tell you about the recipe that I found on the Whole Foods website. And I went, some, I went and got some Atlantic wild salmon at Whole Foods and I cooked it up myself for my family. Wow, it was awesome. You could do the same. Floss Diddle, let me tell you about what I learned about bleaching or taking care of my teeth at Floss. I went there, went to have a cavity, I learned all this stuff, brought it home, I'm going to share it with you now. That's how powerful stories are created, okay? Creating an environment where people are going to own the brand and tell a story related to their experience, okay? So how do we do this? How do we go about creating this story? Here's where we unpack it. Okay, here's where we get down to the nitty-gritty. The right story follows a formula. C plus P plus Yoda, I'll explain it in just a minute, <laughs> equals your solution. What does C stand for? C is your client or customer. P is the problem that client or customer has. Yoda, we all know who he is, but that's the tool. Okay, that's the tool. That's the secret sauce that helps you reach the solution. And almost every legendary story throughout history follows a pattern very similar to this. Okay, you think about it. Moses, right? He had a problem to solve. He had a staff, part of the Red Sea. His brother Aaron helped interpret his message to the Pharaoh. Right? What about uh, King Arthur? King Arthur had a problem to solve. He had Excalibur. He also had his Lieutenant Lancelot, till he kind of went foul there and went after Guinevere, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> and then think about Luke Skywalker, right? Luke Skywalker had his lightsaber, right? A great tool. But he also had who? Yoda, right? So who do you want to be in this process? You're not the client or customer. Hopefully you're not the problem. No. This is the guy you want to be right here. That's who you want to be, Mr. Yoda. You want to be that crucial ingredient, that missing X factor that helps solve the problem that leads to a solution. Scratch that itch for your customer, okay? Okay, so how to make this formula work? How do we get there? Great, Brady, you got a formula. That's fine. Tell a story. But how do we get there? How do I create or craft a story based on my product or service, my company, my brand? Well, in journalism school, you're taught about the six W's to ask 
Anybody go to journalism school? Anybody ever have this, this lecture, right? So we don't all use it, but basically, if you know these six questions to ask, you're going to get the basic details of the story answered. Who did what to whom, when, where, why, right? Whom did what, who did what to whom, when, where, why? Those are the six W's. But you know what? Uh, we don't have time for that tonight. So we're going to just cut it down to three stories or three questions. And now we're back to Guatemala. Who are you? Where are you going? And who do you have with you? Okay. Who are you? Where are you going? And who do you have with you? Let's start with that first question. Ask the right questions. Who are you? Now, let's go with this. It's, it's a somewhat metaphorical exercise here. So I'm not talking about you. You don't want to ask this question about yourself, but you should be asking this question about the client you're trying to serve. Because I would argue that if you don't have a brand echo tonight, it may be because you don't know enough about the client you're trying to serve. It may very well be. You need to know more. Okay? You need to unpack some of those details. Ask the right questions. You're going to flip the focus. It's not about you. It's about the client. It's not the story that you want to tell about how great your company is. It's a story that you want to allow your client to tell about the experience they had with your brand, your product or service. That's called flipping the focus. That's what we want to talk about. That's the secret ingredient. That's how we get started. Okay. So in order to do that, you've got to ask some really good questions about the clients you're trying to serve. You've got to know them better than you currently do. So what kind of questions? Well, I mean, there's all kinds of questions you could be asking. But for example, what brought you to us tonight? What brought you in the store? Why'd you come? Okay. What products or features matter the most to you? What determines which brand you buy? Okay. And what can we do to keep you coming back? Those are just some examples, some ideas of asking some really pertinent, powerful questions that will give you the ammunition to develop this kind of a brand echo. Okay. Uh, about 22 years ago, Steve Covey wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Right? Heard of it, read it, know about it, live it, love it, daily. Well, it came out 22 years ago, and since then, a lot of people have forgotten about these habits. But number five is what we're talking about right here. Seek first to understand, then be understood. Understand first. 22 years ago, he wrote it, but not many companies, not many individuals are going by this this many years later. You should. You should. Okay? Think about it. Case study, Carl Sewell. Anybody own a, a vehicle that came from Mr. Sewell? Maybe, arguably, the best auto salesman in the state of Texas. Maybe in the whole Southwest. One of the best in the country. Okay, Carl Sewell wrote a book called Customers for Life back in 1990. Very powerful, very helpful. Go read it if you haven't already. Uh, but in it, he includes a 50-question survey. 50 questions that he gives to his customers to help him or his company get their mind around the people they're trying to serve. 50 questions. Okay. Or uh, today, I mean, they've whittled that down. There's also a, a little three-question survey that you pick up at the counter when you go to pick up your car after it's been serviced. Okay. Did we explain what we were about to do for your car? Did we get it done? Did we do it right the first time? Every single customer answers these questions if you go to Sewell. Okay. Because they want to know. They want to wrap their heads around the mind of the customer. They don't need to know themselves better. They need to know the customer they're trying to serve better. Okay, Carl Sewell understands this. He's been doing it for quite some time. So we could all take a lesson from him. Uh, you want to put yourself in the shoes of the people you're trying to serve. Back in 1999, I was working for a TV station in San Antonio, Texas. And we were struck by tragedy. We had a real tragedy. A good friend of mine and fellow reporter and, uh, and anchor, Michelle Lima, this is her picture, uh, was killed at the scene of a story that she was reporting on. It's a tragic auto accident. The entire city really mourned her passing because she was beloved in the city. She was a very authentic person. She was very talented. She was very uh, collegial and a great reporter. So the whole city really mourned her passing and was aware of this tragic accident. But for the first time in my experience, and for most of us in that newsroom, the cameras were turned on us. Not because we were the purveyors of the story, but because we were the focus of the story. Because we were the ones grieving. What's it like to lose a friend and colleague in a tragic way? Cameras on us as we went to the funeral. Okay, it changed me as a human being and as a journalist. Because for the first time, I understand the sharp edge of the tools that we used to deliver the news. 
So the point here is put yourself in the shoes of the people you're trying to serve. The better you understand them, you know them, okay, the better brand echo you're going to be able to develop. So what this means for us is the first step in developing a brand echo is knowing that client. Know them. Get to know them. Understand them. Ask some very valuable, pertinent questions and then listen to the answer. Flip the focus. It's not about you. You may want it to be, but it's not about you. Accurate information, we can call it really the currency of brand economics. You get that accurate information, now, now you've got something to make some transactions. Okay. So, question two. What was the second question that we were asked in the jungle? Where are you going? A donde vas? Where are you going? Bring the fix. Again, I'm not talking physically. I'm not talking about where are you going from point A to point B. You need to be asking this kind of question about the client you're trying to reach so that you understand the problem she's trying to solve. The problem she's trying to solve. What's the hump she's trying to get over? Where, where is she going? What's the issue that brought her in today? Okay. And we all heard the Bono song. Uh, still haven't found what I'm looking for, right? <laughs> well, believe you me, there's a lot of potential customers of yours who are sitting up in their pajamas at Google at 11 o'clock at night trying to answer that question or singing that refrain, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Okay, I don't know why these uh, words are off a little bit. It didn't, maybe it didn't convert over, but let me help you read this. Uh, this is the title of an HBR, Harvard Business Review article that came out about a year ago, and it's calling Adaptability the New Competitive Advantage. Harvard Business Review, about a year ago. Okay, and the premise of this article was, clients don't care how long you've been doing what you do. Clients don't care what resources you bring to the table. They really don't. They don't care what kind of heritage your brand has necessarily. What they care about is how quickly are you able to adapt or change in order to solve my problem. How mobile are you? How quickly are you going to be? Are you constantly looking at your product or service in order to better align with what my needs are? Okay. This is not a brand new concept either. The Japanese have been using it for a long, long time. They call it Kaizen. Okay, so some of you are nodding. You've heard this. So Toyota made this term famous decades ago. Kaizen. That means constant change. Constantly reevaluating what you're doing in order to more closely align with the needs of your customers, your clients. Kaizen. Uh, I was a Marine years ago, okay, and the... Uh, the grayer my hair gets, the shorter I keep it. I'm kind of going, my wife accused me of going back in time. The high and tight, that's what we call it. Uh, but I was a Marine in the Marine Corps years ago, and I had a lieutenant colonel, Colonel Clemmer, at an air base way out in the desert, a place called Yuma. It's where they got the idea for hell. Uh, hot and dry, very hot and dry. You may have heard of Death Valley. Well, it was Yuma first. Uh, but we worked out there together. We worked at a Marine Corps air station. And I was very interested in impressing my, my CO, impressing him with my observations, my suggestions, my recommendations, right? You want to impress the boss. And so I would come into his office and say, boss, this is what we've got to do. This is an issue. This is a problem. And very quickly, he would say to me, Lieutenant Brady, don't bring me the fix. Or don't bring me the problem. Yeah, bring me the fix. Don't bring me the problem. Bring me the fix. And that edict, that command, that recommendation really registered with me, and I still remember it today. So that's what I'm sharing with you tonight. Once you know a lot about the client, figure out what problem that client is trying to solve and solve it for her. And bring that solution to the table. Okay? Bring the fix. Example, Grand Homes. Uh, I can tell this story because Grand Homes was a client of ours about a year ago. Great company, very well run. But... Uh, they're in residential home building. And during this recent recession, you may not know this, but 50% of all residential home builders in the DFW area went under. I mean, literally, 50% of them could not meet the payroll, and they went away. Grand Homes was not that bad, but Grand Homes had some real problems, 08, 09. They were selling homes. They were building and selling homes, but people weren't happy. Okay. The problem was there was no service after the sale. And the CEO, uh, a, fr a friend of mine, Steve Brooks, uh, puts it this way. He says, we were very transaction-oriented. Okay, find the lot, build the home, sell it, move on. Find the lot, build the home, sell it, and move on. Okay. A punch list, nah, not such a big priority. Let the homeowner take care of it. It's their problem now. Or as my kids say, 
It's not an MP, it's a YP. It's not my problem, it's your problem. Great. I don't know where they got that. Maybe their mom told them that at some point. But that was the impression that Grand Homes had in the marketplace, and they were being eaten up in social media. It was all over Facebook. It was all over some very pertinent, well-read blogs in the real estate world. And uh, Steve Brooks took a survey of recent Grand Homes customers. Less than 70% would recommend the company. Wow. That was an eye-opener. Okay. So he had to fix the problem. And what he did, he took a page out of uh, Southwest, Southwest Airlines playbook, and he started treating his people better. Okay, he started a profit-sharing plan within the company. He started a culture committee within the company, and they came up with these buttons. People matter. I don't know if you can see this. People matter. And he meant it. And he wanted to turn around the circumstances for the people closest to him on his payroll with the understanding that they should do more in turn for the customers they were serving. Okay? And they did. Okay? Customer service went way up. They fixed those homes before, during, and after the sale. They went back even after and after the punch list was fixed to make sure those customers were satisfied. He did another satisfaction survey, way over 90%. Just last year, Grand Homes was named Builder of the Year by American Builder Magazine. Why? Steve, the boss, brought the fix. Okay. He listened. He got some great information. He didn't like to hear it, but he got it, and he listened, and he brought the fix. So what this means for us is the second step in developing this brand echo is solving the problem. Just like Lieutenant Colonel Clemmer told me, bring the fix, solve the problem. Your fix is, you can kind of consider it the manufactured product of brand economics. Okay. You're going to fix things. Don't make the customer figure it out. You figure it out and serve up that solution. They will love it. Okay? So let's move on quickly to the third question here. What was that third question that we were asked in the jungle? Whom do you have with you? Quien andas con tu? Anybody speak Spanish? I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Quien andas con Who's walking with you? Right? And again, this is a metaphorical question, so I'm not talking about you specifically. But this is the kind of question you need to be asking the customer. Who's walking with you? Who's by your side? Who can help me deliver this message? Now, here's where we get really controversial and counterintuitive because I'm a TV guy. It's all about a big audience, right? But not tonight, okay? We want to shrink that audience way, way down, okay? It's not such a great deal, it turns out, to be in front of five million people who don't care. <laughs> uh, it's much more important to be in front of five people who care passionately. Okay, just like Marjorie became a transition from being a Zappos critic to a Zappos catalyst for the brand echo that Tony has built so well. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. Nightly news versus YouTube. Which do you think is more powerful? Okay, nightly news versus YouTube. I don't know. I don't know. It depends. Subo, anybody heard of Subo? Susan Boyle. She wasn't on the nightly news. Uh, this is a good social media story as well. But she was the one who won Britain's Got Talent some years ago, right? So there was about 6 million people who watched that program, saw her. About 6 million people, not a bad audience. But then her story goes on to YouTube. 20 million, 40 million. Not all at once, but over time. So the question becomes, for all of us who are interested in developing a powerful brand message, which is the more powerful platform? Where do I want to be? Okay. Do I want to be in front of millions of people, or say 10,000 even, or 10? Ah, this lovely lady. This lovely lady. She doesn't know I put her into the PowerPoint tonight. She'd kill me. It's my wife. <laughs> okay, and she has a, a medical practice here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that she opened about four years ago. And uh, she does some very specific, very special procedures for her clients. And so it was, um, it was noteworthy and newsworthy. And so because she has some media contacts uh, in her life, she got some pretty good news coverage when she opened up this medical practice. Really nice, some nice stories that were aired about the practice and about her going out on her own. Did it drive business? Zip, zero, nada, none. Okay, so what'd she do later? About a year later, again, because she has some uh, good people in her life who know about media, she started putting together some YouTube videos. She developed a couple of short, simple videos that explain her 
practice, her OR, what she does, what the process is, what clients can expect. It wasn't a will it blend, but it was a, a, a couple of nice videos. And she's continued to do that. Now, about once a month, at least, she gets one client who comes into her practice and becomes a new customer or patient because of YouTube. Okay, because they found her on YouTube, because they sought her out. They had a need, still haven't found what I'm looking for. They're at Google, and they find her. Okay, so what does that mean for you and me? Many media often beats mass media, especially when you're recruiting that brand catalyst. Okay, why? Because they're out searching. They've got a problem they haven't solved, and they're going to be looking for someone who can help them. They're going to be looking for that Yoda, and if you're there, front and center, they're going to find you, they're going to experience your brand or product, and if you do it right, they're going to be a catalyst for you, okay? They're going to be a catalyst. Why? We're living in this era of push versus pull media. Push versus pull. We've talked about this. Some of you who've been in the marketing world for some time have heard this many, many times. But it's not so much about pushing the ads in front of people. We're way beyond that. We're tired of that. We put up the barriers. We want the bio media that's by invitation only, that's so powerful, we're gonna, it's going to pull us to the table because they're solving problems for us. Okay, Tony Zappo is, or Tony Shu Shea is responding to every single tweet. So I'm attracted to that kind of dialogue, right? Push versus pull media. So the story formula has evolved a little bit. Okay, now I'm not a mathematician. You get in trouble when you're a journalist and you start talking about math, so let's not go too deep here. But we all remember this, hopefully. So C plus P plus Y, that's your client who has a problem. You're the Yoda. You've solved the problem. You've delivered the solution. Now, once that catalyst, that brand catalyst gets a hold of it and they start talking, look out. Okay, how many people do you think Marjorie affected when she started talking about what great, what amazing customer service Zappos provided? Okay. You think she recruited a few customers for Zappos? And what did they pay to get Marjorie to do that? What was that ad budget like? Not much. Not much. Folks, that's how the brand echo starts. Calvin Coolidge said it decades ago. Okay, Our 30th president, he said it this way, No enterprise can exist for itself alone. It ministers to some great need, it performs some great service, or failing therein, it ceases to exist. Oh, there we go. Ceases to exist. It's not a brand new concept. This was our 30th president who said this. So you better find some great solution. You better be able to bring the fix, especially in this crowded, cluttered, chaotic media environment. So I'm hoping that everyone is asking themselves now, what fix can I bring? How can I get my head around that customer or client and solve the problem so that they'll become a catalyst for me? Okay. Example, Lone Star Shipping. You've never heard of Lone Star Shipping, but the people who live in the area right around it have. This is a friend of mine, Brad Ward, who owns a very small postal solutions service near SMU. It's on Hillcrest. Okay. And of course, like almost every postal solutions service, they get pretty busy during the holidays. So what he did for one or two clients a couple of years back during the holidays is he developed a program, a plan for them to make it easier to solve their problem. They could bring in a gift or a package, unwrapped, say, Brad, I've got to send this. Here's the address. Could you take care of it? Absolutely. So they had an account. They would have credit at Lone Star Shipping. Drop off the package, go. And they were sure, they were certain that Brad Ward would get it there. Okay, and he did. And that became such a popular service that now he offers it to anybody. Anybody who wants to set up a credit account can do that. They just drop off the package and it gets there. He solved their problem. Amazing. Uh, a bigger example. Let's talk about Tide. Okay. Hurricane Katrina, 2005, the Gulf Coast, wipes out entire communities. Okay. Tide's sitting around saying, what can we do? How can we help? How can we lend a hand? What could we do for these people? You know, we, our heart goes out to them. What, what solution can we provide? What do we do? Well, we wash clothes. Okay. They sit down a flatbed trailer with a bunch of these washing machines on the trailer, and they just started doing laundry. Just doing laundry. It's not a big deal, but it matters a lot when you've lost your home and you don't know where you're sleeping the next night. 300 loads of laundry done per day. Oh, and by the way, it was all free. 
Loads of Hope program. Do you think that triggered a brand, a brand echo? Do you think people were talking about Tide? Oh, my gosh. Is that why they did it? Maybe. But they solved a problem. They got to the heart of the matter. They understood the client, solved a problem. They brought the fix, and they shrunk the audience. It wasn't a big, big audience who received this service, but the brand echo was huge. Companies that understand that serving is the new selling will be the ones to land new customers. <clears throat> Ann Handley, she's the chief content officer for marketing props. She's got it. Calvin Coolidge got it. We should get it too. How do you bring it all together? Bring it home. Okay, how do you meld all this together? Let me tell you one more story because I'm a storyteller. Uh, December of last year, Los Angeles International Airport, the busiest time of the year at one of the busiest airports on the planet, Los Angeles International Airport. Now, you have to understand, for the airline industry, online departures and arrivals mean everything. Okay, that's how you live or die in the airline industry. And Southwest Airlines does a great job. They really do. But on this particular occasion, Los Angeles International Airport, December, there was a plane that was loaded except for one seat. And it was waiting at the gate. And the owner of that last ticket to get on board was stuck in the security line a whole terminal away. You've all been there, right? You're in the back of the security line. You're trying to get ready. You're taking off your belt. You're getting ready to go through the scanner. And it's terribly slow. And the person in front of you has three kids. <laughs> and there you are. And that's the situation that Mark Dixon was in. Okay, he says, honey, the, it, you know, it, it, I'm not going to make it. He called his wife on his cell phone and said, look, honey, I'm stuck back here at the back of the line. He was frantic because he was trying to get home to Denver. He had a two-year-old grandson who was on life support at the hospital who doctors were saying was really not going to make it. So grandpa was trying to get home. He called his wife and said, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to find another flight. Can you check for me? She says, yeah, I'll do what I can. He's waiting. He inches forward. He finally, finally, finally gets through the line. Now he's running through the airport. You know, put it, we've all done it, right? You're in your sock feet. You're putting on your belt, <laughs> carrying that one carry-on bag. He finally gets to the gate. It's a true story. He finally gets to the gate. The seats are all gone. The seats are all empty. The lights are out. There's no one at the counter. There's one person standing at the door. It's the pilot of that flight. He says, are you Mark? Dixon says, yes, sir, I, I am. And the pilot says, well, they can't leave without me, and I'm not going to leave without you. Let's go. Let's get you home to Denver. Wow. So the backstory is the wife had called Southwest Airlines checking on flights. She tells the story about her husband. That customer service agent talked to another person within Southwest Airlines. They called L.A. They got in touch with the crew. The captain makes a decision. Really? They held up an entire plane for one guy? Yeah, they did. So analysts say, uh, airline analysts say, that this happened because of the culture at Southwest Airlines, because they've made customer service such a priority that everybody within the organization is empowered to make a decision that's going to bring the fix, even if it's just one person in a time of great need. So, did that trigger a brand echo? Did they intend it to trigger? Does Southwest Airlines need a brand echo? Probably not. Bags fly free, right? <laughs> but it did. Okay, word got to a blogger, a travel blogger, who heard about this, about what Southwest Airlines had did. That blogger writes about it. The travel section of the Dallas Morning News picked up the story, Southwest Airlines, based in Dallas. Then it gets picked up by the local television stations. Then it goes to CNN. Then it went around the world. Wow, because Southwest Airlines brought the fix. They did the right thing for a, an audience of one. Oh, let me go back here. The third step in developing that brand echo is finding the catalyst. So you want to shrink the audience. You want to shrink the audience. You want to make the biggest difference for the, the client, the customer, the catalyst, who cares the most. And your catalyst is really the distribution platform for brand economics. That's gonna, how you're going to get the message out there. That catalyst talks. And quickly now, this, uh, this last picture is from a, another famous children's story. Can you tell I'm the dad of young kids? <laughs> These stories all resonate with me. So Alice in Wonderland has had a fork in the road, right? Cheshire cat in the tree above. 
You know what she says, right? She says, which path do I take? Which way do I go? Cheshire Cat says, well, it depends on where you're going. And Alice says, well, I don't really know where I'm going. Cheshire Cat says, well, then it doesn't matter which path you take. Okay? So if some of you feel like you're at a fork in the road and you're trying to make a decision about which way to go, okay, the decision has to be based on your growth. You want to go toward growth. And so my suggestion tonight is you get your head around that, that client. You understand what it is they're trying to solve. Solve the problem for them. Shrink the audience to that one person, and you'll be well down the path of growing your business. Build a brand echo to grow. Okay. So how to get started? Summarize here. Okay. Remember those three questions that we were talking about in the jungle? Who are you? To answer that question, you flip the focus. It's not about me. It's about the client I'm trying to serve. Where are you going? The second question was, where are you going? Okay, you got to bring the fix. You've got to bring the fix to solve the problem that client, client is trying to address. Okay, and lastly, who do you have with you? So the answer to that is found by shrinking that audience down. Shrink it down to the one person who really, really cares about what service you're able to provide and who is going to talk about it for you and trigger that brand echo. Okay. It's bigger than business. This is something I alluded to before. Uh, companies have a brand echo. SOP has a brand echo. Xperia Pro, AMS has a brand echo. People are talking about the products or services. But the people who work here also have a brand echo. Okay, you'll create a brand echo after you leave this room tonight. Individuals have a brand echo. What's going to be said there? My dad... Uh, passed away about three months before we got married. And uh, he spent all of his life, he grew up in a small town, Georgetown, Texas. Heard of it? It's a suburb of Austin now. Uh, but he lived his whole life there. And it was a wonderful life. It was a great life, right? I mean, he was the first president of the Rotary Club. He served on a bank board. He grew a small business in that little town. And so invariably, when I go back to Georgetown, for whatever reason, I'm going to hear a story, something I probably didn't know before about my own dad. Because somebody will come up to me at a meeting or at the coffee shop. You know, there was a time when your dad, he uh, okayed this loan for my brother, and it really made a difference. Or, uh, you know, your dad taught our son to skip a rock across the pond. Did you know that? No, I didn't know it. I grew up kind of assuming those things, but I was taking them for granted because I was in the immediate audience, I guess. Uh, but there's all kind of stories that ripple around Georgetown about my dad. And so I'm pleased to know that my son, Sam, knows about his dad, his grandfather, Sam, because of that brand echo that still reverberates. It's powerful. So your company can have a great brand echo. Your family can have a great brand echo. And if you do it right, by answering the right questions, you can have a great brand echo too. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions for Jeff. Oh, Don't yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. One or I two questions that's... for Jeff. What happened in the jungle? Oh, what happened to the jungle? I buried <laughs> left the him lead. Hanging. I know, I left him hanging. <laughs> so we answered the three questions. We got past the checkpoint. We got the story. We came home to San Antonio, did a three part series, Scoop the New York Times. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great moment. Uh, but it was a time of transformation for me. Because I went from being the pseudo-celebrity in little San Antonio, Texas, to being a servant and trying to figure out what was the best story that we, what were we there to do? Was it to exploit the people in that community or was it to serve them by telling a great story? Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, one more question? Yes, ma'am. So the book, the book that you lend me, is, this is your question. Yes, this is, uh, this is based on, yeah, the book is based on this concept. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's word of mouth marketing 2.0 or 3.0, you know. But what, what, what people miss is how do we get there? Okay, we know a viral message is powerful, but how do we engineer that? And so that's what we're trying to get at now. How do we engineer that powerful message that travels on its own? So, good. So Jeff's the real deal. When is the book coming out? Uh, probably August. August. August? Yep, this fall. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just looking at his publisher. Where's the book coming out? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so look for the book. You'll hear more about that. And uh, Jeff's a real deal, so uh, spend some time talking to him. Uh, he's one of the most gracious mini celebrities that's tall and handsome that I have ever met. So Thank you. Uh, let's hear Thanks for being here. Thank you.